very close range. This isn't high altitude gun camera video from bombers way up in the sky. This is very close range, real time, real battle photographs from Apache helicopters flying in squadron formation and coming right down on those pieces of equipment that at once and at one time were able to defend those Iraqi Republican Guard divisions. Of course, right off the top of the briefing, Linda, the key questions to General Myers, what's happening at the Saddam Hussein International Airport, and did the coalition have anything to do with this blackout in Greater Baghdad? Here's what he said. On the airport, uh, and like any objectives in and around Baghdad uh, for ground forces, we just can't comment on that. That has to be... That'll be up to General Franks, and we'll report after the fact, not before the fact, what their objectives are. Uh, they're on the outskirts of Baghdad uh, right now. In terms of the power, uh, Central Command has not targeted uh, the power grid. And there is no speculation we're being given here at all, Linda, from the Pentagon about why the lights are out there. There are all sorts of suppositions out there. Maybe the Iraqis did it to try to give themselves some sort of tactical advantage. Clearly, that would be a miscalculation. Coalition forces operate very well and very thoroughly trained to operate with night vision goggles. Perhaps they turned them out for some other nefarious reasons. There have been some suggestions that the Shia population, the eastern part of Baghdad, could be in some jeopardy as coalition forces drew near. But that's all speculation. Another huge issue came up at the briefing, somewhat unexpectedly so. One reporter asked the defense secretary, was he aware of efforts being undertaken by outside governments to suggest to the Saddam Hussein regime that it could stay in power and possibly negotiate something less than an unconditional surrender? Here's the defense secretary's response. Both was he aware of those reports and two, was there any validity to them? Yes and no. And there's no question but that some governments are um, discussing uh, from time to time um, some sort of a cutting a deal. And uh, the inevitable effect of it, let there be no doubt, is to give hope and, and comfort to the um, Saddam Hussein regime and give them ammunition that they can then try to use to, to retain the loyalty of their forces with the hope that one more time maybe he'll survive. One more time maybe he'll be there for another decade or so, for another 17 or 18 UN resolutions. And as to the second question, there's not a chance that there's going to be a deal. General Myers also said one other unfortunate effect of these back-channel diplomatic negotiations was to prolong the conflict and by so doing, increase the chance of coalition casualties, civilian casualties, and Iraqi casualties. Back to you, Linda. Major Garrett, live at the Pentagon. Major, thanks very much. Tony? Linda, thank you. As we've been reporting, some of the U.S. forces are, in fact, advancing on Baghdad. Our Greg Kelly has been embedded with the 3rd Infantry Division from the very beginning. He's just fed us some tape of the 3rd Infantry Division advancing toward Baghdad, undisclosed road, undisclosed uh, direction, but pretty riveting tape. Take a look. Roger. This is what you call light engagement. Somebody sitting atop one of the vehicles firing away with a machine gun. It appears, however, to have been safe for the 3rd Infantry Division. Now, as we've been mentioning for the last hour, hour and a half, Baghdad has gone black. Why is that? A lot of people think it's because the Iraqi government itself has flipped off the light switch in the capital of Iraq. Meanwhile, American soldiers are sweeping into the outskirts of the Iraqi capital and launching an attack on Saddam International Airport. Thousands of coalition troops are now inside the red zone. That's the area around Baghdad where coalition commanders have been worried that Iraq may use chemical or biological weapons. On all that, we get a live report now from Simon Marks. He's standing by in Amman, Jordan. Simon? Hi, Tony. Well, the baffling question of the evening here and across this region, of course, is who turned the lights out in Baghdad? It all took place around 90 minutes ago. Coalition forces insist they were not responsible for these power outages in the Iraqi capital, which leaves essentially two possibilities. One, that the electrical infrastructure in the city has been so degraded over the course of U.S.-led airstrikes on Baghdad that the lights just went out because the power system was overloaded. Or the third possibility, that the Iraqi 
Turkey government chose to take the lights out. Hard to understand why they would do that, because the United States forces enjoy an enormous tactical advantage over the Iraqis during nighttime hours. But whoever was responsible for this blackout tonight in Baghdad, the U.S. military is clearly making the most of it. We have heard over the course of the last 90 minutes that an attack is underway aimed at seizing control of Saddam International Airport. Saddam International Airport, as Major was just reporting from the Pentagon, is of huge strategic importance to the advancing allies as they head towards Baghdad because once they seize it, not only do they send the psychological message that they are in control, but also they could potentially use it in future to bring in additional personnel and uh, supplies. Now, earlier in the day, Iraqi officials insisted that not only Baghdad was not encircled by the U.S. military, but they even took reporters to the airport to try and prove that it was functioning pretty much as normally as any airport can when there are no planes flying in or out of it. And then, within hours, came news of this battle for control of the airport. And within the last few minutes, we've been receiving reports from the Reuters news agency in Baghdad, uh, indicating that more than 120 people were wounded in an attack on a village that lies between the airport and the Iraqi capital. Iraqi officials claim that 83 people died uh, in that attack, but that figure cannot be independently verified. A Reuters correspondent reports seeing a pile of dead bodies at one of four hospitals where victims were taken. Most of them, he says, appeared to be military. As far as that electricity blackout in Baghdad is concerned, uh, the expectations all along throughout this military conflict had been that the lights would go out in Baghdad much earlier than this, much earlier on in terms of the U.S.-led assault. Uh, but the military planners at the Pentagon and Central Command clearly decided to keep the lights on in Baghdad, and they have adopted a strategy of trying not to hit the kind of civilian facilities like electricity, like water treatment centers, uh, that would cause the civilian population in Baghdad enormous discomfort. That civilian population had expected power outages. When we were in Baghdad two and a half weeks ago, oil lamps were hot sellers in the local markets. So too was kerosene as people stocked up preparing for what they assumed would be power cuts so that they would have some ability to light their homes. And hospitals around the city in some cases were also being supplied with generators so that emergency wards would be able to continue functioning during a blackout just like this. But at this point, totally unclear who's responsible responsible for it. If it is the Iraqi government, militarily, as they may be finding out at the airport right now, it didn't make a lot of sense. Uh, we will continue to monitor the situation and see if we can get some more information in the hours that lie ahead. Reporting live from Amman, Simon Marks, Fox News. Tony, back to you. Simon, thank you very much. Linda? Tony, thanks. As the news continues to tighten around Baghdad, you see on the right-hand side of your screen that the lights are out. The Bush administration is saying one thing is certain. Saddam Hussein's regime will not survive Operation Iraqi Freedom, but exactly how the end game plays out is still an open question. Geraldo Rivera live now in Kuwait City with more. Geraldo. Hi, Linda. Very pleasant night tonight in Kuwait City, not so in Baghdad, with coalition forces closing in in places within sight of the city center itself. A ring of steel now surrounds the Iraqi capital. And with correspondents traveling with the 3rd Infantry Division now confirming that the Saddam International Airport is under attack, there is this tantalizing possibility that the airport honoring the Iraqi dictator will find itself soon used by the United States as a staging area for the final push to oust the man for which it's named. Now, to get an idea of the airport's location relative to the city center, just think for a minute of Chicago's O'Hare or LAX or JFK in New York City. The good guys are that close to Hussein's capital, within range of the big guns traveling with the third ID. And now that the lights have indeed gone out in Baghdad, the propagandists of the Saddam regime can no longer assure its residents and their leader that the leader is winning the war. The city of five million tonight plunged into darkness, a devastating 15 minute long barrage, and that blackout perhaps bringing the reality of war more profoundly to the residents than anything before this. And since the coalition has, as our, or our correspondents have been saying right along, has had the ability to put those lights out long before tonight, speculation about the timing of the failure of the city's power grid, whoever is responsible, like the timing of yesterday's daring palace raid in the capital city, indicates perhaps that the end is in sight for at least the conventional aspect of this two-week-long war. But what happens now? Will the remaining Republican Guard forces desert their exposed positions on the outskirts of Baghdad? 
or will they flee into the city itself to make a last stand? Up until now, as you know, those guardsmen have been considered by Saddam Hussein as being too unreliable to allow inside the capital. Hussein's fear right along has been that these guardsmen will turn their weapons against his regime. How those uh, regular uh, Republican Guard forces will interact with the so-called special Republican Guard, Hussein's elite, is one of the questions whose answer will determine how long this war will last. The other big question, of course, is whether the paramilitary forces that have put up so surprising a fight up until this point will quit when the capital is invested, or will they melt into the countryside, Tony and Linda, to continue to fight, harassing our supply lines, continuing to resist Vietnam style, even after the capital or most of it is occupied? Or will the snake simply die when its head is cut off? Tony and Linda, back to you. Geraldo Rivera, live in Kuwait City. Geraldo, thanks very much. We have a Fox News war alert. Some uh, new information coming in about what some other nations are saying about the effort to forcibly disarm Iraq of its weapons of mass destruction. This is coming in uh, via the Reuters wire. Apparently, uh, France's prime minister is saying that the United States, quote, made a moral, political, and strategic mistake in launching the war on Iraq. No details on the circumstances where, when, or how this was said, but the, this is coming in via the Reuters wire that uh, French government officials are saying the United States has made a moral, political, and strategic mistake, even though many Iraqis are saying that the hour of their liberation is near. We'll keep you posted as we get more details in here to Fox. I'm Eric Shaw of the Fox News Channel World Headquarters with the latest on coalition progress and Operation Iraqi Freedom. The blackout in Baghdad that we've been reporting and telling you about continues at this moment. This is Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld says no deal for Saddam, that there is no chance the U.S. will make any arrangements to stop the war and let Saddam out. Rumsfeld saying it is time for senior Iraqi officers and officials to surrender, making that declaration and saying that 45 percent, nearly half of Iraqi territory, now is in coalition-led hands. Large sections of Baghdad continue to be in darkness for the first time during this war. While there's no word on exactly what caused the loss of power, the Pentagon says that it has not targeted the power system of that city. It went dark just after 50 minutes of thunderous explosions that rocked the capital's outskirts, potentially connected to the battle for control of Saddam International Airport. Airport is about 10 miles from downtown Baghdad. This is video from the airport taken earlier today. There have been a series of explosions there, and we're told that our troops are expected to secure it shortly. Reports that there are dozens of killed and injured Iraqis in that battle. Rumsfeld says Iraqi troops, meanwhile, from the regular army, now being brought in to reinforce the battered Republican Guard divisions currently defending Baghdad, bringing in uh, members of two divisions from the north to the south. This says there is heavy fire in some areas as our forces swept north, amid evidence that many Iraqi troops have simply run. The 7th Infantry crossed the Euphrates in Nazaria. The Marines say they have secured the city, that city, uh, Najaf. Uh, thousands of Iraqi citizens there lined the streets welcoming our troops as one prominent Muslim Iraqi cleric has issued a fatwa not to attack our soldiers, but instead to help them. 4th Infantry Division, a fresh battalion, now in Kuwait, ready, ready to be deployed in Iraq in just a few days as even further reinforcements. Investigations, meanwhile, Underway in what exactly brought down a U.S. Army Black Hawk helicopter and a U.S. Navy jet. The Pentagon says six soldiers were killed when this Black Hawk went down near Karbala. A search and rescue mission is now underway for the pilot of an F-14 Hornet. Uh, that F-18, F excuse me, took off from the Kitty Hawk. Also today, a soldier has been killed in an apparent friendly fire incident involving an F-15E. That's an Air Force warplane, which officials think may have accidentally bombed a U.S. artillery position south of Baghdad. Commanders still caution, though, that the battle for Baghdad will be a difficult one. This despite evidence that Saddam's regime, they say, is on the verge of collapse, but continue to caution that the most dangerous fighting could still lie ahead. That's the latest. Up to this very minute, I'm Eric Sean. There have been some important developments just in the last few hours as coalition forces are now in Greater Baghdad. There is an assault underway on Saddam International Airport, which is about 12 miles from Baghdad city center. And from what we're hearing, at least so far, U.S. troops are not facing very much opposition. 
The question is, does this mean that that's what's going to be like the rest of the days of the Battle of Baghdad, or could we be walking into a trap? Where is the Republican Guard right now? We're asking that of Major General Burton Moore, U.S. Air Force retired. He was director of Central Command during Desert Storm. General, thanks uh, for being here. Just a quick question about the Republican Guard, since the chairman of the Joint Chiefs was saying it looks like they're still just trying to reinforce the rings around Baghdad. What do you think? Uh, Linda, good afternoon, and Tony, to you as well. It, uh, it looks, in fact, like that is the case that the circlement of Baghdad continues by our ground forces, relatively unopposed by the Republican Guard, and it lends credence to this uh, belief that perhaps the Republican Guard as a fighting force overall, with all of its divisions, is no longer very, very functional. Uh, time will tell on that, of course. Things could implode very quickly. It could be over before we know it, or, as I suspect uh, General Franks believes, this will go on for a few more days, at least until the Baghdad itself is completely encircled. Now a question about uh, some of the other forces that we don't hear that much about, or at least we haven't yet. Saddam's Special Republican Guard and the SSO, the Special Security uh, Organization, which as we understand it are really the ones who are allowed in close to Baghdad, since Saddam re really doesn't trust the Republican Guard that close for fear they might rise up against him. Well, that's true, and, and as uh, we have said, and it now looks like, uh, Saddam has never wanted his Republican Guard, the regular Republican Guard, if you will, to come into Baghdad because he's always been very concerned about an internal coup. The ones he trusts are his special Republican Guard and his special security force. Now, in the past few days, as we've seen, we've hit those locations where we know they have assembly points, where they have munitions, where they have other capability, we've hit those pretty hard in and around Baghdad. And I think even after the encirclement of Baghdad is complete, we will continue to hit those key regime and leadership targets. And I think we'll be able to hit them at will. Uh, if you'd like, we can go to the screenwriter here real quick and uh, show our viewers just a couple of things that I think are important, both overall and then we'll take a quick look at the map. Sure. As you look here, we've got the 10-mile and 25-mile rings the so-called red zones, if you will. And I've got some Republican Guard tanks positioned there. And if you'll notice, uh, they are about a half to less than size of our uh, own forces as we have basically run over those things and wipe them out of existence if I can get on the right ones. We have totally decimated those. The remaining guard units are not very strong because in part some of their forces have been moved to reinforce the D Medina and Baghdad division which now basically no longer exist. Additionally, if we look here, this white line here is the Sodom International Airport. We've been uh, working on that with special forces, uh, the HC-130 gunship, which you see here, and other airstrikes on supply barracks, other support facilities. And if we go to the Fox flyover, we'll give our viewers a chance to see uh, Sodom International Airport from the air. All right, now a question about Saddam International Airport. It's not like some of the airfields, say, in western Iraq that are very remote where, you know, we can sort of go in a little more uncontested. Here we're talking about a fair proximity to some dangerous places. So what is it going to take before we can actually use that airfield? Well, it'll depend on the situation. Uh, and as you see here, the line is at the 10-mile mark. Uh, Sodom International Airport is 16 kilometers from downtown Baghdad. And as you can see, there is outbuildings and other structures that grow right up towards the airport itself. We'll have to make sure that area is secure, but it can be used very quickly for 101st uh, Airborne Assault Forces, which can come in quickly. It can be used for quick turns on uh, uh, C-130s. It can be used for other uh, support aircraft to get in and out very quickly. And they won't use that until such time as General Franks is satisfied that we have a good perimeter. Uh, let's go back to the uh, screenwriter just real quickly and let me show you a couple of things that have happened. This is a uh, regime command and control facility uh, at uh, the Sodom International Airport right off its boundaries. This is the pre-strike and you see the arrows there which uh, designate aim points. And we'll go to the post-strike real quickly and you can see all over this particular area this thing has started to be hit. So we're beginning to take down the Sodom International Airport supply and support facilities. We'll leave that runway and ramps intact, I'm sure. Major General Burton Moore, U.S. Air Force retired. Thank you very much for the analysis. You're we welcome, Linda. All right. Thank you. Tony? All right, Linda, thank you very much. Well, Fox News has learned that we can expect more pro-coalition fatwas from Iraqi clerics, especially of the Shia variety, Shia Muslims. With that and other news from the region, we're joined by Steve Santani, who is live in Kuwait City. Steve.
Well, that cleric, Tony, is in the city of Najaf, where American forces have now gone into the heart of the city to try to root out any remaining resistance from the Fedayeen Saddam. As you know, they put up a fierce fight in that city, and now U.S. forces are in there trying to quell that violence. It's also the city where the U.S. says Iraqi forces were firing from inside a mosque, a very well-known mosque called the Ali Mosque. It's one of the holiest shrines in the Shiite Muslim world. It's where the Prophet Muhammad's son-in-law is buried. Today in Najaf, hundreds of protesters confronted the U.S. forces, worried that American troops would enter the mosque. The U.S. says it has no plans to return fire that's coming from the inside uh, because that would jeopardize a historical, cultural, or religious site, something the U.S. has sworn not to do. At the same time, a prominent Muslim cleric in Najaf has now issued a fatwa urging people not to interfere with coalition forces. Officials at CENTCOM call that statement by the Grand Ayatollah Sistani a significant turning point and another indicator the Iraqi regime is approaching its end. Farther south, in the besieged city of Basra, British troops have been moving closer to the city center there. The troops from the 7th Armored Brigade were searching buildings to the west of the city today, including a villa belonging to the notorious Chemical Ali. He's a cousin of Saddam Hussein's who ordered the gassing of the Kurds in 1988. Now, the soldiers found the luxury villa deserted, and locals told the troops they didn't know where Ali had gone. Meantime, in the Ramayla oil fields, efforts continued to battle the two remaining oil fires burning there. A team of Kuwaiti experts moved into the area to help. The work has been delayed because of the difficulties caused by extremely high temperatures trying to battle those flames. One expert explained what needs to be done. This well is probably producing something like 15,000, 16,000 barrels a day. And, uh, you know, the wellhead is completely damaged in this one. So when uh, they come back to repair this well, they have to cut the whole thing from down on the ground and build a new wellhead. So it will, they will need to do work over on this one and on the rest of the wells that they have damaged. It's, uh, it's not a difficult job, but it's an expensive job. The securing of the southern oil fields has been one of the big success stories in this war. It was done early on, just around the same time as the first bombing of Baghdad. Uh, and I was on one of the missions where those oil terminals were secured offshore. So not only are the Ramayala oil field oil wells secured, but the pipeline and the infrastructure that delivers oil to ships offshore was also secured very early on. All of this preventing an environmental catastrophe and assuring Iraq's uh, future, economic future, is uh, secure. Alive in Kuwait City. I'm Steve Santani. Tony, back to you. Steve, that was a very cool effect, too. <laughs> Linda, over to you. Tony, thanks. Some breaking news. This coming from our Fox News Pentagon team. Uh, some information about the assault that is underway at Saddam International Airport. We had told you that a task force of the 3rd Infantry Division uh, was being reported as being involved in that assault. Fortunately, the lights are out in Baghdad. You can't see much. But here's what we're learning. That uh, despite early reports from Reuters that there was very little resistance being met by U.S. forces at Saddam International Airport, apparently there's something a little bit different uh, coming from our Pentagon team. Senior defense officials telling Fox that elements of four regular army divisions are currently defending that airport. Now, as for the size of the, ele the elements, it's unknown. Uh, it's also unknown how well the regular army can defend this airport. Uh, as you may have been able to glean from our coverage over the recent days, the regular army is not exactly the fiercest opponent that the United States and, and the U.K. are uh, facing here. It's more the Republican Guard, the Special Republican Guard. The regular army are often viewed as ragtag, and it's from the regular army that uh, most of the, the uh, surrenders and defections have happened. So exactly how fiercely they'll be able to defend this airport or how much they want to defend this airport is entirely in question. But we want to get you that information just coming out from our Fox News Pentagon team once again. Four regular Army divisions of the Iraqi military currently defending Saddam Hussein International Airport. We'll get to more details very shortly here on Fox. And as the lights remain out in the Iraqi capital, there's a live picture. Not much to see. Who ordered the blackout? U.S. Central Command says it did not do it. But who did and why? We'll take you back to the Pentagon at CENTCOM's forward headquarters in Qatar. Also, President Bush rallying the troops at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina today. An update from the White House coming up here on Fox. Hi, I'm Airman Vasquez. I'm aboard the USS Kitty Hawk B-3 Division. I want to say hi to my beautiful daughter, Desiree, and to the Trout family in Chicago, Illinois. And you're watching Fox News.
Found the perfect house? I think so. Where are you getting your loan? Uh, our agent knows this mortgage broker. How do you know it's the best loan for you and not the mortgage broker? Uh, we don't. Well, at eLoan, you get a personal loan consultant who's not driven by commissions on the type of loan you choose. So you get the right loan at a great rate. That is a great rate. Nothing should come between you and the right loan. That's why there's eLoan. Apply now at eLoan.com or call 1-800-ELOAN-35. Get it tonight, only on Trio. Now, Yellow Book! They're here. Yellow Book, all over town. Everywhere I go. Oh, great. Yellow Book, Yellow Book, Yellow Book. I told you guys, we're in trouble. So you think we could uh, transfer to the cell phone division? After this, we'll be lucky if they stick us on poles. With pigeons? More people choose Yellow Book, not the other book. Call 1-800-YB-YELLOW. Where do you get your pet's flea, tick, and heartworm medications? Oh, what a hassle. I take the dog, drive to the vet's office, then sit and wait. I just call 1-800-PET-MEDS, and my pet's medications are delivered right to my door. Wow, I paid a lot at the vet's office, and I paid a lot less. 1-800-PET-MEDS guarantees the lowest price on all your pet's medications. Order now and receive free shipping. Hello, I'm Kieran Chetri with the latest headlines now in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Coalition forces are at Saddam Hussein's doorstep just outside of Baghdad. Witnesses in the city are reporting a series of explosions and also report hearing the sounds of planes flying overhead. The target is Saddam International Airport just 10 miles southwest of the city center. And this information coming now from Pentagon sources. Fox News has learned that elements from four Iraqi regular army divisions are now defending the airport. It's unknown how many Iraqi troops are there. Members of the Army's 3rd Infantry Division also carrying out that siege, and members moved into position last night facing little resistance. As we speak, Baghdad is blacked out. You're looking at a live picture from the Iraqi capital where, for the first time since the war started, electricity is out in most of the city. U.S. Central Command says the blackout is not the result of coalition bombings. A search and rescue mission is underway now for the pilot of a downed F.A. 18 jet. The Iraqis say it was one of their surface to air missiles that caused the crash. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Richard Myers, says the plane may have been shot down accidentally by one of our Patriot missiles. President Bush taking some time out today to meet with Marines at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. He rallied the troops saying the Marines missions in Iraq have been tough but that no one signs up to be a Marine because it's easy. He also sat down with uh, families of loved ones lost in the war with Iraq. At least 11 American troops who died in Iraq were based at Camp Lejeune. And those are your latest headlines from Operation Iraqi Freedom. I'm Kieran Chetri. Kieran, thank you very much. An update now on uh, what we're just now reporting. Senior military officials telling the Fox News Pentagon team that it, it appears that there are four elements of Iraqi regular army divisions who are dug in at Saddam International Airport and that seem to be battling coalition forces. Our Major Garrett standing by live now at the Pentagon with more details. Major? Well, that's right, Linda. And here's what's important to point out when we talk about Republican, regular Republican army divisions. These are less well paid, less well trained, not the elite forces at all. And all we're talking about is elements of four regular army divisions guarding and defending Saddam Hussein International Airport. We don't know how many. We don't know their disposition. We don't know how they're arrayed around the airport. But senior defense officials here believe what the 3rd Infantry Division Task Force, who is there now and who is involved in a firefight for Saddam Hussein International Airport, that's believes what they're dealing with on the ground, which would be elements of these four regular army divisions. And I can tell you, in the entire history of this short conflict, whenever regular army has been engaged, it has been decidedly an unfair fight, one always unanimously or almost unanimously, and very little casualties suffered by coalition forces. Let's go on to what has happened to some of the Republican elite Republican Guard divisions. And there was some gun camera video shown here at the Pentagon today of the kind of pounding the equipment, at least, attached to those Republican Guard divisions have taken. What you're seeing on screen now is gun camera video from Apache helicopters destroying either a T-55 or T-72 Iraqi tank or artillery positions, or artillery equipment, rather, arrayed around Baghdad. 
Now, this is not high altitude gun camera video, but very low altitude from Apaches who fly low in squadron formation and meet out that kind of punishment. Now, in addition to what we've developed about what's happening at Saddam Hussein International Airport, I can tell you that Pentagon officials, generally speaking, are mystified about this blackout throughout Baghdad itself. Central Command has said it had nothing to do with it. Pentagon officials have double-checked. They don't believe there's any coalition activity that is a part of this blackout going on in Baghdad. Don't know its military significance. One thing to point out, of course, is a blackout in no way would work to the disadvantage of coalition forces who train thoroughly and are well equipped to deal with night fighting with night vision goggles plus tactics. This is a live picture of Baghdad. Looking at the watch now, it's almost two and a half hours at least that Baghdad has been in this complete blackout situation. Again, it appears to mystify folks here at the Pentagon. Linda, back to you. All right, Major Gary, live at the Pentagon. Major, just keep us posted as you get more details. Tony? All right, Linda. Well, a lot of us have seen in the last couple of days some pretty dramatic pictures of a rescue. The first rescue of a POW in more than, well, almost 60 years. Jessica Lynch, a 19 year old private first class, was rescued by her colleagues from an Iraqi hospital. But now we're learning also details about what happened before she was captured in the first place. Carol McKinley now joins us live from Fort Bliss, Texas, where Lynch was stationed before she shipped out to the Gulf. Carol? That's right. Hi, Tony. As you say, this is the first POW rescue which has been successful from an enemy-held position since World War II. That's why this is such a, a great thing to see. Jessica Lynch is recovering from her injuries in Landstuhl, Germany right now and will be transferred to Walter Reed Hospital as soon as possible. The injuries, broken bones, knife and gunshot wounds. In fact, there's no word on how she got the broken bones, but I talked with her grandmother this morning who tells me she was shot in the leg and got that injury when she was captured March 23rd. And we know so much more today about her heroics that day. And she shot at Iraqi soldiers when she was captured until her gun was empty. This video released today of her rescue takes us into the hospital where she was held. She'd been there wounded with no food for eight or nine days. Special operations forces brought her out on a stretcher to a waiting Black Hawk helicopter. There were at least 15 others from the 507th Maintenance Company who were ambushed that day. Seven are missing, five are POWs. Eleven bodies were found in and around the hospital. The military has confirmed some of them are Americans and it says it's working to identify them, but that doesn't do much for the families of those missing and captured soldiers. They're on pins and needles waiting for a phone call and they've been calling the Pentagon. The word is no news and Donald Rumsfeld said about an hour ago when he was asked by reporters about those 11 bodies and whether they've uh, come close to identifying them that he can't talk about it yet. Tony, Linda. All right, Carol McKinley, thank you very much. We've just gotten word that there's another tape being run on Iraqi TV of Saddam Hussein. It's a tape of short duration. It shows him with, among other people, Taha Yassin Ramadan, his vice president. When the tape becomes available, obviously, we'll show that to you, and we'll also keep you up with, to date with all the other breaking developments. And now over to Linda. Tony, thanks. We're taking you to the Mediterranean now. Coalition planes flying their missions off the USS Truman, just one of the several.